Bike could have Kenton Thomas Kisquas, um, Sikwak Makaluh, uh, my Kias and Slaz are Dr. Mary Thomas, Mark Thomas, Herbie and Vera Johnny, and uh, my parents are Phyllis Jerry, Jerry Thomas, and um, my son is Susep Sewell. Um, I'm from the Sikwak Nation, I'm from the Skitchin Indian Band, or otherwise known as Nskongas Band, and uh, today I'd just like to talk about um, my experiences with uh, the art and the art and craft of uh, storytelling, or as we call it in the Sokakmukaluka, Shtepikwala. I think with this one, I'll start off with uh, the concept of knowledge holder, because uh, a lot of people think that just because you're given a story or given uh, a word in Sokakmukchin or your language to say that you now can do with it what you please, and in my experiences as a, as a as a emerging storyteller, that's not the case. Um, someone gives you a song. Um, it's your duty to sing it. That's it. Uh, one time, my son Susep uh, told me he went up and sang a song, and I said, "Well, where did you find the courage to do that?" And he he didn't know. He said, uh, "I." Uh, he, he, someone gave him a saying one time and he thought about that at that moment. Someone told him that uh, if you know a song, it's your duty to sing it. If you know a story, it's your, it, it's your, it's your obligation to share it. And if uh, you know our, and if you know our culture and traditions, you, you, it's your uh, responsibility to pass them on. So knowledge holder to me is someone that does exactly that. They. They don't claim to um, know the knowledge, or not know the knowledge, but to own the knowledge. And they don't claim to have been the creator of knowledge. We pay homage, we pay respect to the, the ancestors that came before, and we say that they're the creators. They got the knowledge from the land. They pulled the knowledge from the land. The land gave them the knowledge, and then they were able to pass it on to us. And then the real owners of these stories and this language and all the teachings that come from land-based and uh, indigenous education belong to the, the Tukamuk, which means the people to come. So they're the ones that really own the language. And uh, right now we just hold it in trust for them until that day comes. Okay, so the knowledge that I feel is really important to, to us and that needs to be passed on to the next generation is everything, everything that we have and know, and and uh, hopefully we can recover some more of our teachings and some some more of our stories, because I believe, uh, in my belief, and from some words from elders and and teachings from elders, I I feel like the stories are still out there, the stories that were originally here and then lost because we there's no way through colonization and assimilation and residential schools and all that, that we retained all of our stories. I'm sure we lost so many, but I believe that the, the stories are being held in trust by the land. They once came forward, they'll come forward again. So we're gonna create more stories. So what what's really important for me is to keep what we have now moving and to ensure that that the Tugaumuch, the people to come, the babies, the the future generations, they get that language, they get that the, these teachings. They they understand that indigenous education is all is all encompassing its surrounding. In what ways do you pass on the knowledge that you carry? In what ways? Um I try to do it as uh freely as possible. Uh, I barely, rarely ever say, barely, rarely, I barely ever say uh, um, no. I barely ever say ta'a when someone asks me to to perform for them. Unless it's something like a, like a birthday party or, or a corporation or something like that who just wants some entertainment for the night. I feel like uh, that these stories aren't just entertainment. If they want entertainment, they can hire themselves a magician or a clown or a DJ or something. These stories 
we like to look at them as lessons as entertainment. So um, you learn two kinds of lessons. You learn how not to behave and how, uh, how the world came to be. So you learn things in these stories and they, they're, while they're entertaining, they're also lessons. So in, it would be like asking a teacher to come to your, to your party and give a lecture on, um, I don't know, on plants plants or or uh, language arts or something it wouldn't it just doesn't make sense to 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 ask someone of that and uh, I uh, I also tr I go into a lot of schools um, I, I now work for SD 73 as the Abo as the Aboriginal resource teacher so I'm in in and around Kamloops a lot but um, my my boss lets me travel quite freely to other communities as long as they have something in exchange for my services, which means not, not money or anything like that, but if they have a teacher of some sort of knowledge or something, they can send them over at some point in time in the future and we'll take care of them and they'll share their teachings. So in that essence, we, we always try to share and make sure that we build up relationships with other school districts and other, uh, other uh, communities. Um, okay, all of them, all the stories. I'd like my grand grandchildren and great grandchildren to, to hear all the stories that I share. And uh, what stories would I like them to say about me personally is that um, I tried my hardest that I, 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 you know, I fell, I kind of fell into storytelling. It was, it was just a release and outlet for me at first, a way to perform, a way to be seen. Um, and the way to be funny. And I kind of fell into it. And now that I'm this far into storytelling, I, now I, I see how important and vital that these teachings and these lessons go on because, because of the importance that they are to the land and to my ancestors and to my and to my future generations. So, all of them. Okay, I think today I'd like to share the story of a uh, of a uh, loon. So, um, loon a long time ago, a long, long, long time ago, there were these two chiefs, blue jay and pine jay, and they uh, they they uh, their people were really sad because uh, for four seasons, they had suffered a lot of losses in their community. So one thing that us Sequekmik and a lot of other nations like to do is we like to have a big feast and, and commemorate and to mem memorialize uh, the ones that have gone on. And we also like to play stick games because stick games are a lot of singing and a lot of uh, good feelings and gambling and you win a little bit and you lose a little bit, but you, uh, you end up coming out on top because you feel really good. So they decided to hold this uh, feast and hold these stick games. And they invited a whole bunch of other cookbees from all over the land and their peoples. So they were expecting a lot of people to come. So they said, well, we need lots of food for feasts. So they sent, uh, so the women, they, they went out and they started getting roots and berries and the men went out hunting elk and uh, going fishing and doing other stuff like that. But it was Loon who really, really stepped it up. Loon built himself a, a, a canoe out of birch bark. And uh, he made a big fence, like almost like a fish weir. that went like this all about, and it was really big. And uh, he put that fence into the water until it was about waist deep or chest deep. And then he, uh, he put his canoe in the water and he just sat there and he, he instructed uh, Blue Jay and Pine Jay, the cook bees, the chiefs, to go up into the mountains and chase all the deer that they could find down with them and their dogs. And so the dogs and Blue Jay and Pine Jay all chased all these deer down there. And when they, when they came down, they hit the fence, but they were in the water so they couldn't, uh, they couldn't maneuver around very well. And it was easy pickings for, uh, for for Loon, Loon just swam around with his bow and arrow and he just, and he, he caught as many, just as many as he needed. And then afterwards, um, 
they brought him home and they, they skinned him and they, they made a whole bunch of gifts and everything and they prepared a lot of food. And then the day of the feast, all the cookies and everyone showed up and they showed up to the, to the blue, home of Blue Jay and Pine Jay and their people. And uh, they started off by handing out gifts to, especially to the people that helped, you know, the women that went out and got, got, uh, got roots and, and berries, they gave them little gifts. And they gave they gave some gifts to all of the hunters. They said, Here, "Here's a gift." Uh, but it was uh, Loon. They were really impressed with his uh, initiative and his innovative ways to uh, to provide for them. So they uh, so they gave him some dentalium. And dentalium is uh, is a shell that you get from the west coast, and we're, we're way up here in the plateau, so it was hard for us to get get a. Uh, Get dentalium. A lot of it came through the grease trail, through the Newhawk, through uh, Chilcot, and then to us. So when it got here into the the home of the Blue Jay and Pine Jay, it was really valued. It was a great rich. So when they put it around them, they put two necklaces around his neck, and he had these two beautiful necklaces. One real short, and one that kind of hung down. And they gave him this beautiful shirt with a uh, with a. Uh, with dentalium all over it. And then they gave him these two leggings that went around his legs, with, just adorned with, with dentalium. And boy, Loon was looking at himself going, wow, I look good. But then he wasn't the only one who thought he looked good too. Golden Eagle, one of the cookies from, uh, from uh, one of the other nations saw him as well. And he, uh, he liked the dentalium and he thought, oh boy, I'm gonna get that somehow. But Golden Eagle's a really good stick gamer. So he challenged uh, Loon to a game. And uh, they started playing and they're singing their songs. Oh, and they're gambling away. And eventually, eventually uh, Golden Eagle won all of the sticks, almost all of the sticks off of Loon. He had three left, three sticks. And uh, that's when um, Golden Eagle looked at Loon and he said, if I win, I get all of your dentalium. And Loon, Loon agreed reluctantly. He went, oh, my, oh yeah, if you win. And uh, all of a sudden supper was called. They went, hey, supper, time to eat. So all of the people went to go eat. And then all of the cookies, including Golden Eagle, made their big, big speeches. They all talked. They all went, oh, this is what we love. They all talked about what they needed to talk about. And afterwards, uh, Golden Eagle found Loon again after all of the speeches and the feast was done. He went and found Golden Eagle again. He said, all right, that's it. We're going to finish this game off. And boy, Golden Eagle is just about salivating. He wanted that dentalium so bad. So then he, uh, he called, they, they just about started playing. He picked up his drum and his drumstick and he was getting ready to sing and start pointing and winning sticks off of uh, Loon. But Loon looked down and goes, oh no. Oh no, Golden Eagle, we're gonna have to take a break. And he said, whoa, what for, Stemmy? What for? And he goes, oh, because I, I don't have any swamp grass. And he goes, what do you need swamp grass for? And he goes, oh, I'd like to use swamp grass to hide my bones. And he goes, ah, and he goes, look at the lake's just right there. It's just right there. I can walk down there and grab some and be right back. And Golden Eagle went, oh. Yes, ma uh, go then, go and hurry. Let's get this over with. And uh, have you ever seen uh, a loon walk? They walk like that. They, they're horrible walkers. And he's walking like this and it's about as graceful as a, as, a, as a rock rolling up a hill. And he kept on flopping. He'd get back out, wander, flop, and he'd wander and flop and wander and flop. And all the, pe all the animal people were standing there going, Wondering, holy smokes, is this for real? Are we really watching this? Everyone else knew, like all of the people of uh, Blue Jay and Pine Jay, they knew he, how horrible of a walker what he was. So they knew what he was up to. And as soon as he got down to the water, uh, Golden Eagle came, I up, he became really angry and he took to the air and flew into the air and he flew over there. But by the time he got there, uh, um, Loon, dove under the water and then he popped up and he went Whoa! and he just laughed 
and he he looked at Golden Eagle, and then he went back under the water, and he popped up way over somewhere else. Oh, and then he laughed, and then he popped up, and he oh, and then he oh, he did this four times, and he, every time it just made Golden Eagle even more eye up. So Golden Eagle knew what he he had been tricked. He knew that uh, Loon had ne had no intention of ever ever giving him all of that dentalium, that dentalia. So he said, that's it. If you want that dentalia, you're gonna keep it on forever. So he used all his power. And he, uh, he made that dentalia stick to, gold, to Loon, exactly the way you see him today. And that's why Loon looks the way he does. He looks like he has all that dentalium all over his neck, two little necklaces, and all over his chest and his back and on his bottom legs. And that's the story of Loon. My uh, perspective on education is that it's all encompassing. It, it's in everything we do in our daily life. Um, because the teachings that, base, that, that uh, Indigenous education are based upon are from the teachings from the land. So when our, when our ancestors were first here, in my knowledge, when the ancestors were first here, they uh, they weren't taught, they weren't, no one really, sh you know, the animals would show them how to eat and what to eat. You know, the carnivores would go and eat meat and then they'd see that they could eat that meat. And the animals would eat certain plants and they'd follow them and they'd eat the same plants and they'd get nourishment from it. So in that essence, they were, they were taught how to survive. But then when they started developing their thinking and their language, it came from what they saw and experienced on land. And it would, it would, as I know it, they would fill their heart and their mind with that word and then they would express it. Demuch um, means our land. So something like that would, uh, would come from the Demuch, from the land. And they'd be able to, uh, to express that thought or that knowledge. So if you look at it in today's way, um, we don't place any more importance on the language. We don't place any more importance on the land or the stories. And uh, the stories represent our laws. The laws come from our stories. Um, I was sitting with an elder one time and we were looking at this, uh, at this uh, proclamation written by the chiefs of Silk, uh, Sikwak Mikuluk and Chilkotan and they wrote this proclamation to Sir Wilfrid Laurier in 1910. And James Tate, the ethnographer, read it out to James Tate. And he, uh, and it talked about interference. It talked about how the Semet, when the first white man came, they had a good uh, relationship, a good working relationship. And then it went downhill after that, after the second and third generations of people came. So they, they needed to fix that and they, they needed to get rid of the fences and boundaries and borders because the land in, in their minds did not belong to anyone. It belonged to everyone if it belonged. And so if it belonged to anyone, it belonged to the plants and the animals because we were just the pitiful creatures who they helped. So I was sitting there with that cook bee and he goes, well, where do you think they got that knowledge from? And uh, where, do you, uh, where do you think they, they pulled those words from and he goes, do you think they just grabbed them out of thin air and pulled them out and then put them in their mouths and then spit them out into that piece of paper? And I said, uh, I don't know. And he goes, well, think about it. And so we thought about it for a while and he goes, he goes, where does the language come from? And I go, um, the land. And he goes, correct. And then he goes, uh, where do you, so if we got the language from the land, where did we get the stories from? And I, I said, the language. And where did language come from? The land. So what do the stories represent? And I said, the laws. And he said, well, if the stories are in the laws, where do you think they pulled these words out for this, for these settlers, for these colonialists who were on our land, who were interfering with the work we were doing? Would we not express our laws to them? And I said, oh, and I got it immediately. Because what he was saying was that we pulled the stories right here, front and center, and we used the stories to 
and we used the laws that are expressed in those stories and we extracted them and put them into words that uh, Samak could understand. And we, uh, we presented our laws to them with their own words. And uh, as the story goes, uh, um, Sir Wilfrid Laurier at the time took it and he said he was gonna do something about it, but then he got voted out 10 months later. So nothing ever became of that proclamation, but we still hold it true. Very, it's still very relevant and true to this day. So with, uh, with that big old story, I come back around to what is Indigenous education. Um, indigenous education is all encompassing. It has everything in it. It, it. it relates back to our land, to our laws, our, our stories. And I think that's why, especially at this time in our existence, um, with our renewed uh, vigor for, for culture, for identity, for heritage, for traditions. I think our shteptikulas are, are vitally important because we're, we have to realize and, and figure out what those laws are again so that we can start living by them and so that we can start um, educating ourselves again on what those are. And we'll get there, I believe, you know. Um, we're all connected to land, whether we go picking berries or we go, we go hunting or we go even just share a story out in the land. All that indigenous education is coming forth. Um, I was talking to this, uh, this uh, feller the other day and he was talking about how he would, how he go to the same creek every single year to go fishing. And uh, this uh, Sama guy came up to him and he goes, he was standing up and he was all authoritative and he had his arms up like this and he went, he goes, what are you doing here? And he looked around, he, he seen that he was talking to him and he looked up and he goes, uh, I'm fishing. And that, that white guy looked at him and he goes, who gave you permission to fish here? And he said, uh, my ancestors. And uh, the guy said, well, that's not good enough. So he went up and talked to him and he talked to him in a good way. He, didn't, uh, he wasn't confrontational about the whole thing. But he, uh, he explained to him that it was his right to be there, that his ancestors, by taking care of the creek and taking care of the salmon before him, uh, that gave him the right as a descendant as of one of his ancestors to be there to practice, keep on practicing their uh, collect their rights to be there. And then he went on further to say, but his title, his title, that what gives him the title to be there isn't just because he's a descendant of his ancestors. If that was the case, then everyone has the right and title to be out in the land. He said his, what how he proved and took claim of his title was by going out there and cleaning that creek and making sure that it was taken care of. Because in his, in his words, the, the ones that used that creek and lived in the creek and recycled their life there, you know, the trout and the little salmon and all the fish, they, uh, they can't do that. So he would, uh, he would, do the work that they can't do for them because they do their job. They go, they cite, recycle their life, they go way out in the ocean, then they return to feed us. And that's their job. And to recycle their life and then to go back out and do it again. That's their job. They're doing their end, he said. Our end is to protect, to clean that, to do our title. So to me, that's what Indigenous education is all about. It's about taking care of ourselves and taking care of the land. I see it really growing um, astronomically. Um, and not only growing, like, but more people having an understanding of it, more people making it into meaningful contextual um, lessons and bringing it into the classroom. Even right now, the BC curriculum as the way it is, embodies a lot of that. Um, I was sitting with some teachers last year and we were studying the curricular competencies and I was looking at them and I was like going, geez, you know, a lot, the, when you break these down, they really sound like teachings, teachings from the elders. And I, I would, uh, I would uh, parallel and I'd collaborate onto the teachings of the elders and I would parallel them with uh, the curricular competencies. And uh, the, those other teachers started going, oh yeah, they could see it. And 
I think with the openness of it now, instead of teaching being so compartmentalized and classified, now it's more like all encompassing. It's all around everything. So I think it's just gonna grow astronomically and uh, with our people becoming stronger and, and, and finding more avenues to share their strengths and their knowledge with others that it's just gonna keep on going forth and it's gonna, in 10, five, 10, 20 years, it's gonna be something to behold. It's gonna be something, it's gonna be quite the sight and it's gonna fulfill a lot of our, uh, a lot of our uh, ancestors' prophecies about our, the young bringing back our teachings and our teachings will live again. They'll rise up from the land and they'll be, they'll be there for us to see and share. And my final thoughts, um, final thoughts is that personally the, the Shtap Tikvalas for me have, uh, they uh, gave me a chance. They gave me an opportunity to share not only my ancestors' teachings and my ancestors' knowledge, but also uh, a chance for me to share who I am, to, to create an identity for myself, to create an identity that I hope is uh, one of uh, goodness and kindness. Um, so with that, I just say, thank you.